Amen. Let's take our Bibles this morning. We're going to turn to 2 Samuel, way back in the Old Testament. And uh, I just have a word that I believe God has put on my heart for you today, for us to hear together. And I think it's important that we hear what God wants us to hear. Can you say amen? So how many are happy to be in God's house today? Awesome. Awesome. Well, I'm glad to be here too. Otherwise, I would have felt differently maybe. So I'm glad we're here together and we're here to hear what God has to say to us. How many remember this song? It's maybe a song we sang uh, some years ago in church. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, I will answer and obey. When your spirit speaks to me, help me out. With my whole heart, I will see. And my answer will be yes. Lord, yes. Stand up. Let's sing it real quick, a cappella, real quick. Ready? How many know it really well? Sing it loud. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, I will trust you and obey. When the Spirit speaks to me, with my whole heart I'll agree, and my answer will be yes, Lord, yes. Yeah. Amen? You can have a seat. How many would agree that is God's heart that we need to have? This willingness to say yes to what he says to our lives. A willingness to say yes to God's will, when his spirit says do this, we say yes, we answer him. We need to have a willingness sometimes, and I think all the times in our lives, like Isaac had a willingness to lay his life on the altar when his daddy Abraham said, we've come to do an offering and offer a sacrifice to God, and um, you're it. You're not so energetic now about that, are you? We've got to be willing to say yes when God calls us to do something. And I know that most of us have already said yes to the Lord, meaning that we have received Christ into our hearts and into our lives. However, the yes that I'm talking about today goes a step deeper than just, yes, I need you, Lord, in my life to save me from sin so I don't go to hell and burn there forever. That's nice, isn't it? But the yes I'm talking about takes God from being just our Savior to our Lord. Do you hear me this morning? The yeses that have to follow that first yes to him are the ones that take us closer to him, that builds us into the disciples of God, that makes us the man or the woman of God that he wants us to be. Those are the yeses that I'm talking about today. So don't misunderstand me. We need to say yes to salvation, but there's more yeses that he wants us to continue to say to him. Can you say out your amen this morning? Because, good, I didn't hear outs, that's awesome. Because God is calling us to go deeper in him. God is calling us to go further in him. God is drawing us closer to him. You know, because there's some times in our life that we've made that initial yes, and we think that that is enough. What grieves my heart the most is I've seen people in and out of church through the years, in the short time I've been in the ministry, and we come and we say yes to God, and we make a decision for Christ, and then we feel like that's all that I needed, and I never see those people come back to church again. And there's really kind of an epidemic in our world today, if we're really honest with ourselves, to think that we don't really need church. Uh, surprising to me, kind of like what you read in Corinthians about how can the hand say to the eye, I have no need of you. You need church. You need the body of Christ. We need each other. And that's a yes that we need to say. Can you say amen? We need to say yes, to continue to surrender to God every portion of our heart, surrendering our hearts to the Lord on a daily basis. And when you get right down to the brass tacks of it, church, there's simply no other way to live for Christ. If we think we're going to live for Christ and do things our way, then we're really missing the point of what this is all about. Because I did not get saved so I could do things my way and yet be saved. I got saved because I realized doing things my way was a real mess. And I needed somebody to guide me and to lead me and to order my steps because I need him 
in my life. And if I really know humans, and if we know the Lord, the truth is there's probably some of us in this room today, and in some way, shape, or form, wrestling with God about saying yes or doing our own thing. And God is speaking to your heart, and there's certain decisions you want to make and certain areas of life you want to take control of, and he's saying, no, you need to surrender to me and say yes to me. And today, God is speaking to you because there's areas you know that are just a little outside of the scripture, just a little outside of the room where God has made for you to walk. And he's saying, surrender that area and watch how much better I can take care of you. Because, you know, as Christians, our goal should never be to see how far we can get from God and yet be still within his good graces. You hear that kind of thing a lot, that we want to see how, how bad can I get without being too bad that God won't love me anymore. Well, we know he'll always love me, but how far away? Our goal should be how close to him can I get? How near to him can I get? And lay aside all the other stuff. Can you say amen this morning? That's God's heart. So today I want to talk to you really simply about the cost of a Christ-centered life. What is the cost of a Christ-centered life? And I want us to discover some costs for living a Christ-centered life today. 2 Samuel chapter 24 is kind of my launching pad, but I'm going to be looking at several different verses of Scripture today. So I hope you have your Bibles out and you're ready to go. But 2 Samuel 24 verse 18 is where we will begin. It says there, So Gad, not to be mistaken with God, came to David that day and said to him, go up and erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. And David went up according to the word of Gad, just as the Lord had commanded. And Aruna looked down and saw the king and his servants crossing over to him. And Aruna went out and bowed his face to the ground before the king. And Aruna said, why has my Lord the king come to his servant? And David said, to buy the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar to the Lord that the plague may be held back from the people. And Aruna said to David, let my Lord the king take and offer up what is good in his sight. Look, the oxen for the burnt offering, the threshing sledges and the yokes of the oxen for the wood. Everything, O king, Aruna gives to the Lord. And Aruna said to the king, May your Lord God accept you. Verse 24. However, the king said to Aruna, No, but I will surely buy it from you for a price. For I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God, which cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. And David built there an altar to the Lord and burnt offerings and peace offerings. Thus the Lord was moved by entreaty for the land and the plague was held back from Israel. Let's pray. Father, we just take a moment here today and pause and recognize this is your word. These are your scriptures, God, that speak powerfully into our lives. We ask your Holy Spirit to join us here today to help us to hear your voice, God to help us to see areas in our life that we might need to pay the cost for. And Lord, that we have to say yes to you about. I pray in the name of Jesus today that you would guide everything that I say. And God, most importantly, that you would work in the hearts of the listeners here. Help us, God, to receive what you would challenge us with this morning so that, Lord, you can draw us closer and nearer to your side. May we be a church that always says yes, Lord, to your will and to your ways, God. That when the Spirit speaks to us, God, we will answer and we'll obey. That God, it begins with us as individuals. May we have that kind of heart. We ask in the name of Jesus. Do a mighty work in these next few moments, we ask. Amen and amen. Cost, price, value. Uh, it seems like everything in life has a price, right? Almost everything. You know, there's sayings that say the good, best things in life are free, and there's truth to that too, but there's so much in life that does cost us. And if we're really honest with ourselves, we know that there's cost to a lot of things in our life. There's a price tag on it. And you know, sometimes a price can either make something sell really well, 
or it doesn't move at all because the price is maybe too steep? Have you ever stopped from buying something because you felt it was a little too high? Hmm? Good for you. Even ladies are raising their hands. That's fantastic. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Usually it's the men that spend more money than the ladies. Would the ladies say amen to that? Yeah, and you, as you give mean glares at the guys, right? Uh, maybe there are some things, though, in life you don't care what it costs because you're going to get it. Don't raise your hand on that one. But I'm sure we all know a little bit about what it is in life to try and live on a budget. The best advice for all of us is to live below our means, right? That sometimes is tough, but we understand what it is to maybe live on a budget, to deal with debt reduction, living by your means. These kinds of things are all wise things. And with that said, we are many times, and I think especially as New Englanders and especially as maniacs or Mainers, I think we like to prefer to be called, right? We don't like maniacs so much. Uh, we prefer to uh, get good deals, barter a little bit, dicker, we might call it, right? How many know you can't dicker with God too much? Anybody? How many tried dickering with God? And, you know, he's really good at dickering, actually, but nonetheless, and if people that listen to this and aren't from New England, you might not understand what dickering is, but anyhow, it's kind of like trying to barter and get a little deal worked out here. Many people think they've dickered with God and made good deals, but yet God is the one that makes the deals, and he says either you're going to pay the price or not, right? And therefore, we really consider the cost of what it is to follow Christ. We really need to consider the cost of what it is to be his disciple. And the truth is, many times we are caught up in impulse buys. Anybody ever get caught up in an impulse buy before? Right? And sometimes that is how church used to be done. We want to get the music just right, the heat just right, the lights just right, the everything just right, and make people choose Christ, and then they've never really counted the cost. The Bible tells us to consider the cost or count the cost of what it is to follow Jesus. You ever been told that? Have you ever read that before? The Bible makes it very clear that if we're to choose to follow Jesus as Savior and Lord, then we can't just make some rash decision. We can't just run and make sure that we get out of a pinch. But he tells us in Luke 14, 28, don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? God asks us to make sure that we really count the cost of what it is to be a follower, a disciple of Jesus Christ, because it will certainly cost you something to follow Jesus. It will cost you something. How many understand that true today? And I believe that as we count the cost, it isn't about finding something that we might regret. In fact, I believe the Bible tells us that when we count the cost of following Jesus, this decision to follow him will be the best decision and that you will be willing, if we really consider what he gives us, to sell everything that we have so that we can buy into Christ. This is what the Bible says in Matthew 13, 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid again, and from joy over it goes and sells all that he has so that he can buy the field. This is what it is to be a follower of Jesus Christ, that we consider the cost of what it is to follow him and even though we know full well what the cost is, we lay everything aside and we sell out for him. We sell out for him. I give everything up. And in reality, that is what each of us have done or should do, that we would be willing to pay whatever price it is to follow Jesus Christ. That's what God's called us to do this morning and even before this morning. And in all reality, each of us, if we're really honest with ourselves, has something we'd almost be willing to pray, pay any price for in the natural. There's something you really want, you save up for it, you find a way that you can get it. Most of us would admit that for some things we have been willing to pay a large price for. We would spare no expense for whatever it might be. How many know what I'm talking about? You have something you've been willing not to mention everybody, to some degree, spares no expense to get what they really truly want. It's always amazing to me how sometimes people can complain, I don't have this or that or the other thing, I have no money to pay the bills, but yet they've got this. 
You know what I'm talking about today? We're willing to sacrifice for something we truly and absolutely want and must have. We can relate to that because truthfully, there's probably some of us are just like that. There's some things we know we don't need, but yet we have it. Hmm? We're willing to make that sacrifice. And my obvious connection today is that we need to value our relationship with the Lord in such a way that we will give anything and give anything up because that matters more to us than anything else in this world. That we'd be willing to pay the price. You see, we often are amazed at people because of how they find a way to get what they want because they know they can't spare the expense. Otherwise, they're going to miss out. There's a story uh, told about a man who went on vacation to the Holy Land, in fact, one time with his wife and his mother-in-law. Unfortunately, while they were in Israel, his mother-in-law passed away there. And so there they are dealing with a, um, uh, this whole situation there in Israel. And as they're there, the, the funeral director was saying, you know, we can uh, deal with this. We can have a nice funeral here and do a burial for $150. And the family is like, well, we'd really like to take mom back home. You know, well, that's going to cost $1,500. Well, the, the funeral director is saying, you know, we can do a really good job here, save you a lot of money, and uh, $150 is all done right here. And the, the husband took the funeral director aside. And he said, look, I have nothing really wrong with what you guys would do here. I know you would do a good job. But I understand that there was a guy here 2,000 years ago that got buried, and just three days later, he rose from the dead, and I just can't take that kind of chance. <laughs> You're going to pay for what you value the most, right? I'm sorry. Forgive me. Forgive me. Do you have something that you will spare no expense for today? Hmm. We determine because our hearts get set on that thing. Listen, living a Christ-centered life is going to come with a cost for us all. It's going to come with a price tag on it, and it isn't cheap. And looking at David's life here, he went into this setting that we just read about together, and we can see that there was a lot going on between David and God, in fact. Previously, David had sinned against God by taking up a census you can read of it back in 1 Chronicles, which tells some of the history. And Chronicles and Samuels, they kind of weave in together a little bit, and some give a little more story than the other. But David took up this census that God said, don't take up this census, instead just trust me. But he kind of went on his natural understanding. I won't take the time to read all that here today. But here's the long and the short of it, is that God prefers that we would trust him over trusting our own wisdom and calculations. And because David said, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get these calculations so I can figure some things out here instead of leaning on the Lord, God was not pleased with that. And God was bringing plague, if you will, upon them. And so the prophet came to David and said, hey, go and purchase a threshing floor. And not just any threshing floor, but go to Aruna's threshing floor. And there, David, you're to build an altar to God. And there you're going to pay this price and you're going to worship the Lord and call upon his holy name and that God would relinquish this plague that is upon his people. Also notice that the location of this threshing floor is on Mount Moriah, which is the very same mountain and location of where Abraham went and offered Isaac up. Talk about a place of sacrifice and of cost. This is it. And as David approaches Aruna to purchase the threshing floor, Aruna says, hey, 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 you are the king. I'm not going to make you pay a price. I'm not going to put this on you. You're the king. You get eminent domain, right? You can have what you want. You can take the threshing floor. You see my oxen. Those can be a nice sacrifice. Use the wood and the, on the yokes. You can burn that and use that for everything. And Aruna says, Lord, let the king take up and offer what he sees is right in his eyes. And now if you are a good pastor, a good wise person, you're going to jump on that deal, man. When we were building our building in Caribou, if somebody would have come up and said, I'll give you all the wood you need for the building that you're building. You would shoot me if I said, no. We want to buy every two by four to build this building. We're not going to take your goodwill. We're not going to take your, your pity. We can buy this. And all the church people, you can imagine, would be like, what are you, crazy? 
How many would think I'd be crazy if that were the case, right? And you'd have a meeting and you would vote me out be it before the end of the day, right? Why would you not take that kind of gift? Well, that's exactly what David did here. There's a story I heard one time about a rabbi that went to get a haircut at the barber one time and the barber didn't charge him and the next morning the barber found at his door a bottle of wine and a nice thank you card. Well, the next day, a Catholic priest went to the barber. I, I'm sorry, is this okay to tell? And the barber didn't charge the priest at all for his haircut. The next morning, there was a bottle of wine there, a wheel of cheese, and a thank you card. The pastor went to get his haircut the next day. She refused to take payment for the haircut from the pastor. The next morning at her door, she found 30 other pastors waiting to get a haircut. <laughs> we Christians love to get things for free, don't we? We love to get by without having to pay a price. But David was quite the opposite. And I think God is speaking to us today to say, you know, sometimes it's not about getting something free. Sometimes things are going to cost, and sometimes you need to be willing to pay the price. And I'm not talking about sticks to build a building, and I'm not talking about stones to build an altar, but I'm talking about paying the price to follow Jesus Christ. Because if we're really honest with ourselves, if we really are thinking and thoughtful about the stuff that we go through in life, we like to cut corners, we like to get by, we like to work out deals with God, we like to get the best bargain and dicker with Him. And you know what? Sometimes we just have to be willing to say, God, whatever the cost, I'm going to pay the price so that I can serve you and give you my everything. And there are times God is saying that's what we need to do. Look at verse 24 again. Listen to David's response here. He says, no to Aruna. Here, take all this free stuff. Do what you want. We should worship God. David says, no, but I will surely buy it from you for a price. I will surely buy it from you for a price. I cannot offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God, which cost me nothing. Let that sink into your heart this morning for a moment. David refuses to offer God something that cost him nothing. Technically, can we offer God anything that we did not have to pay for? Are we really offering God anything? You know, there's different times people may miss the offering and sometimes they'll throw their offering envelope in my hand and say, throw it on Debbie's desk so it can be counted with the offering, right? Now, I don't go and pull that out of the offering envelope and put my name on it. But imagine if I did. Yeah, right? How could I offer to God something that I paid no price for? You would think that'd be abhorrible, wouldn't you? You would think, what a scoundrel. Friends, this is how we sometimes try to get by with God. We try to give him things that cost us nothing and think, well, God's going to be fine. He's happy I'm giving him some. No, sometimes there is a price that is exacted to following him. Sometimes we have to sacrifice. Say sacrifice sacrifice. Sometimes there is a sacrifice that we have to make. Sometimes we don't get to do what we want to do all the time. Sometimes we have to sell off something because God says, I want those monies to go to that. Maybe you've been saving up for something and maybe there's a need in the body and God would tap you on your shoulder and say, no, that really, you thought you were saving up for this. In all honesty, you were saving up for this. Hmm? Oh, you wanted to go on that vacation? Really, that's so somebody else could go on that vacation. You follow me today? There's sacrifice that we have to make. And I guess that we could when we have to ask, we have to really wonder, if you re-gifted something to somebody, is that really a meaningful gift anymore? All right, everybody close your eyes. Everybody close your eyes. Everybody close your eyes. Nothing weird is going to happen. But have you ever re-gifted a gift? Would you raise your hand? Oh, shame on you. Look around in this place. Put your hand down, I mean, before you open your eyes, right? You've re-gifted a gift. And within reason, I'm sure you knew somebody else would really love it when you got it, right? I'm sure that's why. Loretta would never do it any other reason. It was always for the best, right? We re-gift a gift. But let's be honest, is there, 
when we just get right down to it, I don't want this thing and maybe they'd like it better. Is that really with much heartfelt meaning? Hmm? <laughs> it's the thought that counts, right? David says, I can't re-gift this. That would be your sacrifice, Aruna, not mine. God has called me to offer this sacrifice. You see, friends, we've got to remember that there is that wonderful but yet pricey gift that God calls for us to give. And that's the cost of a Christ-centered life. That's what it is to follow Jesus, that there are times we have to sacrifice things that cost us something that actually hurts when we do it. Do you follow me today? It's not always easy following Christ, but nobody promised you that, I would assume. But there's a price there's a price to following Christ. Matthew 16 gives us a proper perspective concerning the costly Christ-centered living that we're talking about here today. He says, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself. Deny himself. If we don't get or we don't do what we want to do, there's a denial of self there. And he says, then take up your cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake shall find it. For what will a man be profited if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? God says there's a price that we have to be willing to pay. And here's the truth about human beings. All of us give our lives to something. All of us give our lives to something. It could be your hobby, it could be some talent or skill that you have. It could be humanitarian efforts. It could be running all over the world and building whatever for whoever. It could be your job. It can be your family. It can be money. You can fill in any blank. All of us give our lives to something because it's something natural within us to give ourselves to something. It could be your golf game. It could be your day on the lake. It could be anything. Hmm? We all give ourselves to something because I think there's something innate within us that is wanting to give everything to something. They say the millennial generation, what moves them today is not having good words. And we wonder why nobody in church is here anymore under the age and this and that and the other thing. A millennial generation today wants to be moved with passion for something. That's why a lot of times church doesn't connect anymore. They need to be moved with passion because there's something innate within us that wants to give, that wants to sacrifice our lives for something, and we put it in the form of a habit or a hobby or whatever it might be, but God has meant it for him to be him, for that void to be him. You follow me today? Because we are meant to give up everything for someone, and that is Jesus Christ. You see, when you really come right down to it, friends, and we think about saying yes to the Lord, Jim Elliott said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. You're not a fool when you sacrifice and give up and surrender things. What you can't keep anyhow, you can't take it with you anyhow. But what you gain is from the Lord. You can never get any other way. And that never dissipates. The Bible says moth and rust will break through and steal. But what we gain in the Lord never can be taken away. I have to ask you a question. What have we surrendered for the Lord lately? What have you sacrificed? For, oh, I know there's a twitch now, isn't there? But that's kind of what I feel God's asking me. And God's asking us. And he might be asking our church. What have we surrendered lately? What have we given up? A few things real quick. Christ-centered life will cost you your favorite sins. Look at Hebrews 12.1. I told you we're going to flip real quick, and we will for a few moments here. Hebrews 12 and 1 talks about a cost. It says, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. Therefore, then we can 
run this race with endurance that is set before us. The Bible makes it very clear that there are those that have gone on in the Lord way ahead of us, reminding us of their victories in following Jesus Christ, also reminding me of their sacrifices they've made. I think of Gene in the grand stands of heaven today, cheering us on. Others that have sat in these seats that you've known and loved dearly, that are now in heaven, that are now cheering us on, saying it's worth it all. Make the sacrifice, pay the cost, because heaven is real and God is alive. Keep running that race of faith. And in fact, the stuff that's holding you back and the stuff that's slowing you down, it's not worth holding on to. None of that will matter in the long run of things. Let those encumbrances go. Let those things down so that you can pursue Christ. But we have our things maybe pet sins, maybe attitudes, those things that we tolerate to a degree because it's just somewhat natural and maybe to some degree we really enjoy it. But the Bible says those things are like weights that hang around your ankles. Those things are like chains that bind up your hands so you can't really fully get running the race like you ought to be running the race. You're staggering along, you're kind of limping along the race. And the Bible says let that stuff go. And those that are cheering on in the grandstands of heaven are saying, release that stuff. Let it out of your life. It's not worth it in the long run. Ephesians tells us we cannot tolerate these things. Ephesians 4.30 says that we grieve, in fact, the Holy Spirit of God when we hold on to those things. We grieve God. You remember that Jesus wept over Jerusalem, didn't he? He literally came to a point on a road and he saw the city in all of its splendor and then he sat and he cried over Jerusalem. Why? Because they held on to the things that were binding them up in their race. They were rebellious towards God. It grieved God, grieved the Holy Spirit, it grieved Jesus to see it. They were rebellious, moved by self, sin-ridden, full of pride. And believers who hold on to those things in life that we ought to be letting go of and paying the price and saying, I don't need this anymore. It grieves God. And we miss out on what God can truly and wants to truly do in our lives. We can't grieve God, friends. We've got to bring pleasure to him. And we do so by obeying him and paying the price and surrendering those things. The second thing it might cost us in this world is this. Look at 1 John chapter 2. Flip over there real quick. 1 John chapter 2, it's just shortly after Hebrews. And it tells us there in chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, do not love the world nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. These passages remind us and serve to Prove as a perfect antidote for our desire for the things of the world and anything this world has to offer to tell us that those things are useless, they're pointless in our life because it is God who lifts up. And when we surrender those things, it sometimes is going to cost us the favor of this world. Some of you maybe before you came to Christ had no troubles with people before, but now that you're in Christ, you have people problems all the time. Is that true for anybody? Because at one time we were going in their direction. But now you're walking against the flow. Now there's some truth to the fact that now we're in Christ. Maybe we ought to be a little more (laughs) easy to get along with with people. But the truth is that now that we're, we're in Christ and the world is not... We're going against the flow and there will be some friction and some conflict and sometimes we lose our favor with people. Sometimes we lose that that amenability, that just cooperative thing. There's sometimes a spiritual battle that is behind the scenes in relationships. Maybe you see it in your workplace if maybe it's your spouse you're married to, they aren't Christians and you just there's just a different mindset now. We lose some of that favor. Why would anything else even matter? We wonder but we've got this battle that begins to happen because the world stands really opposed to God. And therefore, since we're going with God, 
we find some conflict. Even as we, as a church, try to do things, sometimes you don't always have the cooperation you would like from community members or even the town office or things of that nature because we're going in opposite directions. We lose some favor. The Bible poses this question, how can you serve two masters? You're either going to love one or hate the other, right? Because there are two different directions, two different ways we can take on the world that we're living in. And in Christ... We're going with him. And Jesus made it pretty clear. And in John, 3, uh, John 3, 19, it says, And his is the judgment that the light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, for their deeds were evil. You see, there's light in the world. Jesus has come. But there's still men that love darkness in this world. And you see, if our desires are satisfied by darkness, then we've got to take a deep look into our hearts and rekindle that fire once again, if that's our problem. But we need to invite Jesus to be the one that keeps coming in and keeps brightly shining in our world today. And God is calling us to shine brightly in the world that we live in today as well. Can you say amen? Even though the favor of this world may not always be there, even though there might be some friction that we encounter with people on the workplace or in our homes or just in the community, that's okay. I never have problems with people that have problems with me that aren't in Christ. That's the way it's going to be. I have problems with people that shouldn't have problems with me that we're going in the same direction. Yeah, don't look around. That might mean you. But friends, in spite of it, we keep serving the Lord. This is what Jesus said, John 15. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll also persecute you. If they kept my word, they would keep yours also. Jesus makes it clear. Look, they didn't like me. They crucified me on the cross. There was some friction. There were some problems. And you're probably going to have problems as well. That's a cause for what it is to follow Christ. Now, I believe as God is able to give favor, I believe that God can work things out. Don't misunderstand me, but don't get frustrated when they don't work out well either. You with me? You understand today? So we've got to understand God is calling us to live surrendered lives to him and pay the price for that. The third thing we need to remember as a Christ-centered life is it might even cost you financially. Yes, I dared say it. It might cost you financially. To follow Christ. Look back at the scripture we read at the beginning, 2 Samuel. You remember David refused to get this threshing floor for free. He refused to allow it to just be given to him. How could he offer to God something that cost him nothing? David bought it. David paid the price. And guess what? There was no missions fund that he could go back to the church and ask for help for. He could not go back to his pastor and say, hey, you know what, prophet, I needed a little extra money. Could you get it out of the coffers of the church? No, there wasn't any of that. He didn't go back and say, you know what, we're going to have to take up a pledge to defray some of the costs. Will you people over the next year help me pay down the price of what it was to buy the threshing floor and to offer the sacrifice? There was none of that, right? He didn't get on TV and say, I'm going to sell vials of water out of the River Nile or something like that. He had to pull out his wallet. He had to pay the price. 50 shekels. Some say that was near five to seven years worth of salary to obey God in that one action. That's a lot of money. How many would agree? I know. You can make from 20000 to 120000 But somewhere along the median range of 50, 60 grand. But nonetheless, he paid a high price to obey God. A high price. And all through the scripture, we see different things about money. I know we don't talk about it much because I'm told it empties churches out and makes people mad. And I found it to be true. But the truth of the matter is, friends, that God does have some financial things connected to this. I know that there's an attitude, even on a Facebook thread I was involved in this week, with friends joking about pastors and always wanting money all the time. I don't want your money, but God 
for some reason requires it of us at different times. And he asks us to give back to him 10% in obedience to him. That's why we take up this offering and we do it in obedience to him and we worship him by doing it because we say, God, I'm going to obey you in this. And for some strange reason, there's a bunch of you that can live better on 90% than the 100% because God has been faithful to you. There's times we take up different offerings for missionaries in this place, and for some reason, God calls us to participate in the ministry that they do. We need to pray, and that's easy, but sometimes we need to give, and that's always tougher. But it's a sacrifice. Sometimes there's a need to put a roof on a building or siding on the building like we had to do a few years ago. We're still paying that off, by the way. Just let me throw that out there to you if you'd like to give to the building fund. But we have to take care of God's house, can we not? We could let it rot and get black mold, and then you wouldn't want to come in here and say, I would never go to that church, right? It costs to do what God has called us to do. Wish we could let kids come to the school here for free with no tuition, but there's a price to do the ministry of what God wants us to do. Do you hear me this morning? I don't talk about money much, so don't get mad and don't go home and complain and have roast pastor over your lunch today. But there's truth to it. We ought to be willing to give financially to the Lord's work. You're not giving to me, you're giving to the Lord. If you think you're giving to me, you've misunderstood what this is about, and that's why you're all sour about it anyhow. I tithe too, by the way. I know how it feels to write out those checks. But we give to the Lord, and we trust him with the money because every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father above. So if I get a paycheck, it might have Debbie's signature on the bottom of the check, but she didn't give me that. God gave me that. And your checks have come to you not through the work of your hands necessarily, but through his. Not because your boss is generous. You probably think you need a raise anyhow, but because he's given you it. You hear me today? So we read about the widow's might in the Bible. I know it's gotten quiet in here. I ought to keep going real quick here. But Jesus made this statement about himself. You know, I, I got thinking about this, and I'm going to wrap up here quickly. Jesus' life to follow his Lord, his Father, cost him. He told people that he had no place to lay his head. The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but Jesus said, I have no place to lay my head. Now, here's a funny thing. He was a son of a carpenter, and I just can't help but think he knew how, at least in the movie, he made a table, right? Right? In the Passion of the Christ, he made a table. I have to think, if he's God and he had some carpentry skill, he probably was the best carpenter that probably would have ever been out there. He could have probably put people under with his ability. Just thinking for a minute. If he's Jesus, he's God, right? Fully God, fully man, son of a carpenter. He probably had more ingenious ideas and had greater skill than anybody, but yet he chose to lay that aside is it okay just to think with you for a moment? To follow the will of his father to the point that he had no place to lay down. He didn't have a home. He didn't have, you know, a bed to call his own. When he sent his disciples out, he told them not to worry about filling up their money belts, that he would take care of them along the way. And God is wanting us to get our minds off that money piece all the time. And understand it as a tool for what it is, that God gives it to us so we can take care of what we need to, but there are times we have to give it and times that we have to put it into the kingdom of God and there's times we're going to pay our bills and your CMP bill that goes up higher all the time and all this stuff. But you're going to keep on keeping on and trust God. The cost of a Christ-centered life, the fourth thing, is it's going to cost you first place in your life. And I probably could have said this and covered all the rest with this. But isn't it true that salvation isn't about you anymore? It isn't about living for self anymore. I'm not my own. I, there, man, there's this, this Tony part of me that wants to rise up and be my own all the time. Do you know that? I, I guarantee there's probably a Bill part and a Celicia part that jumps up, and probably a James part that jumps up every now and again, and a Mark part that just, I want my way. Anybody understand? 
and I have to continue to shove him down and step on his head and push it under my feet because it's not about me anymore. It's not about my will anymore. I've got to give God first place in my heart. Salvation is about trusting in Jesus Christ alone in all things, following his will, not my will, his will. But not just for salvation, but also for everything else in my life. Everything. And salvation is ultimately surrendering complete and total control of your life into his hands. We've mentioned a few different classifications of cost, but ultimately it comes down to this one thing. Is he Lord of your life or not? The old saying is, if he's not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. Because the Lord isn't Lord of 99% of the kingdom, or else he's not Lord of the kingdom. We can't hold out a piece of this. You know, we saw it played out when we were in college. His friends would get girlfriends, and they used to hang out with the crew in the dorm, and now all of a sudden they're disappeared all the time. They're with their girlfriend. Now the guys didn't matter anymore. And we get mad, and we'd say, we're never going to end up like him. Matt, he just took off. He was always with Karen. You know, that's just the way to, I'm not, when I find a girl, I'm just not going to be like that for me. How do we know how well that worked out? You see, God, we're willing to give up our time, our energy, our monies for these other things. Why wouldn't we do that for the Lord? Hmm? Why wouldn't we give up everything for the Lord? You see, there's a difference between salvation and surrender, like I said at the beginning. I'm wrapping this up. Angela, come up to the top here and get me off this place. (laughs) There's a big difference between salvation and discipleship, though. Your salvation didn't cost you anything. We're saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Right? But your discipleship, you're growing in Christ. You're becoming the man or the woman of God that he wants you to be. That's going to cost you. That's going to cost you something. Because now you have to continue to surrender. You have to continue to lay yourself down. You have to continue to lay your ambitions down. And that's what God is calling us to do today. Be willing to pay that price the cost of Christ-centered life. You say, well, he's Lord of my life. I'm a Christian. Well, that's a part of it, but that's not the whole, friends. God is calling us to walk this journey with him, not just get saved, but now I'm a disciple. And that means serving others. That means giving. That means helping. That means all a multiple, a myriad of things. That means that I have to lay down my ambitions and desires to give to others. And guess what? You don't ever time out of this thing and get so old, you don't have to do it anymore. And you don't have to wait until you get old enough to know any better. It begins right now for every single one of us. And if we're trying to do it any other way, we're missing the point of what it is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. What's he calling you today to surrender, to pay the price? to give him your heart today. There might be sins that we need to lay down. There might be the sacrifice of the favor of the world that we think we have to have. Maybe it's some amounts of finances that we have to surrender to the Lord. And ultimately, it's that number one spot in your life of who you're gonna live for. Remember, Jim Elliott said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. I want to challenge you today to be willing to make the sacrifice, be willing to pay the cost of what it is that God has called you to pay. So can you bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment? Let's allow the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts this morning before we rush out of here. Praise you. God, I don't know what it is you want to speak to every one of us. I believe there's specific things for each heart in this place today. 
that you might be calling us to surrender and yield to you. And God, this isn't especially an easy or fun message for me to preach, but there's so much truth in it, God, that following you is going to cost us a price. And there's some things we need to be willing to lay down, God, so that you can have more of our hearts and more of our lives, so that, God, you can also come in and rearrange the furniture of our life and accomplish in us what you so desperately desire to accomplish in us. Lord, today we say, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I just live for you alone. But if there's something today you recognize, you've got to be willing to pay a price on, church. Would you just raise your hand for a moment in acknowledgement to the Lord and to the Holy Spirit that there's something you need to surrender to him? Is there anybody else? There's just something else you've got to give up. There's something you've been holding on to, something self and ambition, a desire, whatever it is, God. We're saying today by upraised hand, I'm going to surrender it to you, God. I'm going to give that thing, that area, that, that piece of me that I've held back for me, God. I'm going to give it back to you today. I'm going to take this step deeper in you, God. I'm going to go further in you, Jesus. Because I've been stunting my own growth by resisting you. And today I choose to allow you to have that area. In Jesus' name, amen. With heads bowed, eyes closed, one more question. Is there somebody here today, you need Jesus in your life? You need to surrender your life to him, make him savior of your life, and begin this journey of discipleship that I've been talking about here today. With nobody looking around, and I'm not even here to make you join my church. I just want you to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And it begins by bowing your knee and saying yes to him. Is there one that would say, I need Jesus as my Lord and Savior? Raise your hand. I see one hand already. Is there a second? Thank you. I see a second hand. Is there anybody else today? Say, that's me. I need Jesus. I need to give him my life, my all, my everything. I see two hands. Is there anybody else today? Let's all pray this prayer together with these two that raise their hands. Dear Jesus, I give you my life. I give you my soul. I'm choosing today to live for you completely. No matter what the cost, no matter what the price, I say yes to you, Jesus. I acknowledge that I need you. And I believe in you today, Jesus, that you came to this earth to die on the cross in my place as a sacrifice of my sins. And so I confess you as my Lord and my Savior and choose to follow you now the rest of my life, paying the price and the cost of being a follower of Christ. Amen and amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning. We worship you, Jesus. And thank you for those that have said yes to you, God.